In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to be talking about computer time and technology getting in the way of direct experience outdoors. Bushcraft knife rust prevention in wet climates, duvet jackets. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about water filtration combined with other methodologies for water sterilization time to take to set up camp, what are reasonable expectations, a slug invasion and trail mix. Welcome, welcome to episode 60 of Ask Paul Kirtley. We've made it to 60. And I'm now back in the northeast of England um, where I'm spending a bit of time out and about. And some of you may recognize this spot. It's just on the way past one of my favorite walks, looping back at the end of the day. So it is getting a little dingy. Um, if you're watching on the video, you will see the light fading a little bit. It's quite windy today. I've tried to drop down. I know this is a relatively sheltered spot in the bottom of a little um, gill and there's a beck flowing through here. The wind out in the fields is stronger. I've dropped down here. I'm below some uh, Norway spruce on that side. I've got a nice big oak tree here. So I'm relatively sheltered, but apologies if there is any wind noise on the audio, particularly if you're listening on uh, the audio only podcast. So without further ado, I'm going to crack on with these questions and make use of the available light. And just going through the order that they've dropped into this file for this uh, episode. Um, first question is from George and George is asking about computer time and technology. And his question is, hi Paul, I really appreciate your output online. The information you give through this series, the Ask Paul Kirtley, and your blog posts as well as your podcast is fantastic. I noticed that all the Ask Paul Kirtleys, apart from maybe the Bushcraft Show episode, are hosted in the open air. It easily gives the impression that you are constantly outdoors, but I'm guessing you spend a lot of time editing videos and audio files, writing blog posts, and I've also noticed that you seem to take the time to respond to comments on your blog. Between all this and Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, I'm guessing you spend a lot of time in front of a computer or your phone. How do you feel about these technologies and them getting in the way of direct experiences in the outdoors? Thanks, George. Um, well, that's a, that's a really good question, George. And I know I say that a lot about questions that they're good questions, um, but that's an interesting one. It's not directly about uh, bushcraft per se or even outdoor life per se, but um, I'm guessing that most of you that are watching or listening to this um, are people who enjoy the outdoors, but you also enjoy listening to or watching or reading or all three uh, material about the outdoors and maybe even in particular about bushcraft and survival skills. And so that's something that's relevant to all of us. And yes, it, it, in short, there is a balance to be struck there George and it and it's a it's a question I'm quite happy to openly answer you know I could read that as, as a bit of a criticism in the sense that oh you're an outdoorsman but you spend all your time doing this this computer stuff and that's that's a question that should be thrown at people like me who are producing material and sharing it online it's also a question that should be thrown at other people that are sharing um, material on YouTube, on Instagram, and um, I think it probably should also be put in front of people who are writing books, because writing books is a very time-consuming process, generally. Ask anybody who's written a book. Um, the word count in books can be 60 to, in an outdoors book, 60 to 90,000 words, hundreds of photographs or illustrations. It's a big job. Um, producing a book 
takes a long time as well. So anybody who is sharing material um, through any channel, including television, um, filming professionally is also time consuming. Um, setting up shots, getting multiple uh, angles, um, having an audio person there, having a cameraman there, getting all of the logistics sorted, it's time consuming and expensive. And then of course there's all the editing and voiceover work for them and uh, promotion of shows. And so anybody who is sharing material, sharing their knowledge, sharing their experience, the question is valid for, for all of us. And I think it's a good one. Um, so for me, um, I, I do what I do full time. Um, for starters, and I don't have another job. I don't have another work uh, place that I go to um, where I'm doing this on weekends. What I do is is what I do. Um, this this is uh, the life that I lead, and I teach people. Um, I would say I spend about 20 weeks of the year. Um, teaching students on courses and leading clients on trips um, sometimes a little bit less sometimes a little bit more depends on whether i'm doing any private things um, but that's generally just as a baseline i would say if i'm going to divide my time i'd say i spend about 20 weeks of the year um, through from late march through till about now so late october early november when this has been recorded, this has been recorded in the last week of October 2017. I spend about that amount of time um, outdoors. Um, and then I also do my own trips, um, weekends away canoeing, um, trips in the winter, any, any of the winter camping stuff you've seen in recent years with my friend Ian in particular, um, that's all on my own time. Um, hiking in the mountains, um, and just generally spending time outdoors like now I'm, I'm staying with my parents for a few days for four days and i will be out every day while i'm here doing something for at least half the day every day tomorrow i'm going out for a hike for the whole day friday i'll be out all day um saturday morning i'll be out um and so I do spend a lot of time outside and unfortunately I can only share a certain amount of that. Um, we're lucky now in a way in terms of me sharing stuff that a lot of the places that I work in the UK whether it be in East Sussex where we have one of our main teaching sites or the Lake District or Scotland and um, where I work regularly every year all of those places have half decent mobile phone coverage and so I can regularly share um, Instagram posts, for example, I really enjoy sharing one or two or three at most Instagram posts every day and uh, just showing things that we're up to and trying to inspire people to get out. And that's part of the reason I do it. I want to try and encourage people to come out and yes, do things with me, of course, I'm going to be honest about that, but also just get out and use the skills that they're learning. Maybe they've come on a course with us already. Maybe they've watched YouTube videos and they, they should be going out and practicing those things and just getting out and in, interacting with nature going out and seeing what they can see, going out at all times of the year as well. If I can set an example to show that I am out a lot of the time, whether it's be, be summer, autumn, winter, spring, hopefully that encourages people to get out a bit more as well. Quite a few strong gusts of wind coming through there. I hope that's not affecting the mic too much um, at the moment. So one of my motivations for sharing online, and it is it is something that I have to keep in mind to remember to do things, to remember to share things, remember to take photographs. Um, part of my motivation for doing that is to inspire other people to get out and enjoy uh, the outdoors, enjoy nature. Um, and I think that's important because um, otherwise people don't value it. If, you don't, if, you, if you're not there and you're not seeing um, what's going on with birds in the hedgerows and animals in the forest and animals in the fields and going out and fishing and doing what you do outdoors, canoeing, hiking, then you, you're removed from it. I think there's direct benefits, there's direct benefits to your health, both in terms of physical exercise, being in a natural environment, and then of course you value the environment as well. Um, so I think it's important to try and be, be an example and to, um, and to encourage others outdoors. So that's part of the reason 
I, I do what I do. Now I mentioned I spend about 20 weeks a year out with customers, um, students, clients, and I tend to have 10 to 12 people at most on any course or trip, sometimes less. Um, some of our wilderness trips we might take less, seven or eight maybe. Um, so at most maybe I'm having direct contact with two to three hundred people a year um, where I can um, help them have an outdoor experience, I can share uh, skills, I can coach them directly in those skills, I can help get them up the, the learning curve, not, not to be too cliched, I know some people don't like that phrase, but to get from A to B with their learning goals as quickly as possible. And that feedback loop that is um, available when you have an experienced instructor is good at teaching, um, you know, myself and my colleagues that we can share those skills and we can tutor you and we can help you and we can tweak your skills and get you to a point that maybe would have taken you multiple, multiple weeks just by trial and error on your own. Um, if we can do that in a week-long course, that's very valuable, but there's a limited number of people that we can do that for in any given year. And so I want to have, it sounds egotistical and it, maybe it is, but I want to have more of an impact than that. Um, I I'm very grateful that I'm in the lucky position where I have had the opportunity to have a lot of great experiences outdoor, travel a lot, and to have some great mentors and great people to work with over the years. And that it would be entirely selfish of me to try and just keep that for myself. And yes i'm interested and i've always been interested in wilderness skills survival skills bushcraft um, the mountains the rivers paddling um, walking i'm a mountain leader i'm a canoe leader uh, as well as being a bushcraft instructor um, i love foraging i like um, some aspects of shooting i like fishing i like the outdoor life and i want to be able to share my experience and experience that I've learned from others and the knowledge that I've learned from others working with people like Ray Mears and Lars Falt and David Scott Donnellan and numerous other people and try and share my perspective on those things with other people and I want to be able to affect more than a couple of hundred people a year. Um, yes I want to do that, don't want to dilute that but equally um, I want to be able to, to share that knowledge more widely and that's one of the reasons I started my blog seven years ago I started that blog and there are hundreds of thousands of people who visit that blog every year whether they're repeat visitors which I know a lot of you that are watching this and listening to this are or whether they're people who are googling a particular question and they're finding the answer in my material and that makes me happy it makes me happy to see um, that there are a large percentage of the people who are visiting my site who are not in the UK. So they are people who I would probably have never connected with. They would probably never have learned anything from me. They would probably never have had the benefit of me putting that information out unless there was the internet, unless I put it on on the web. Unfortunately, there's a limit to how much of that I can do as well, because as you've rightly said, George, that it takes time. Writing, personally, writing, I find, takes the longest. Um, sitting down to write, the process of typing, um, I can touch type, it's one of the things I learned at school. Um, I did an information technology course when, when I was um, 16, 15 and 16, and one of the things they taught us to do was to touch type, and it has been a very, very useful skill, the fact that I can type pretty quickly. Even so, getting the ideas down on paper by typing is relatively slow. Um, I do sometimes make voice notes while I'm out and about ideas um, because when I'm out in the woods and I'm out a lot as I've said um, it's the inspirational place it's where the ideas happen and I like to try and make notes I do use my phone as a notebook I make notes in notebooks as well um, and I do sometimes use uh, voice recording and then I've got a, a pool of ideas and thoughts and inspiration there for when I get back to my office to my study and I can um, hone some of those ideas into articles whether it be for publications, whether it be for magazines, or whether it be for my own blog or the Frontier Bushcraft blog, which I contribute to along with other people who, who work for me. And that's the idea there is that that 
that inspiration that comes from being out is then fed out to other people. So there's some technical knowledge there, there's some experiential stuff, there's some safety advice, etc., etc. And we want to share that with people so they get the most out of the outdoors. And that's really, as I say, my motivation. But there's a limit to how much of that I can do. Writing is quite a slow process. Going back, I tend to write stuff down, leave it for a few days, come back to it, reread it, edit it leave it maybe a little bit longer, come back again and try and hone it and then put it out. Um, and that's a slow process. Um, when my blog became more popular in the early days, in the first few days, the first few years, um, I started to get a lot of emails and I used to try and answer all of them. Um, and it got to the point a few years ago where I just couldn't, I just couldn't keep up, partly because I was out a lot um, in the woods teaching. And when I'm teaching, I struggle to even look at emails never mind keep on top of them and so what I was finding was I was, I was spending an awful lot of time when I got home trying to, to play catch up with emails with Facebook messages etc um, etc et and one of the things I found was that people were asking similar questions over and over and over again and that was one of the inspirations for starting Ask Paul Kirtley um, so that I could answer questions um, in a relatively timely fashion and I could get them back out to people and it wasn't just the person who asked the question who received my reply by email who benefited because typing a response takes about four or five times longer than speaking the response and what I'd started doing as I say I use voice recording sometimes to get ideas down I was recording the answer and attaching the audio file and sending it back to people and then I thought why don't I just do that publicly and then everyone gets the benefit so that's how I started this so it was something I was trying to do but failing to to answer everybody and certainly when I was getting similar questions I was struggling to answer all of those questions repeatedly and I thought right let's do let's do this podcast and originally it was just going to be audio but then I thought let's do video as well because th that that benefits everyone it benefits people who prefer to watch on youtube it benefits people who prefer to listen on a podcast via itunes apple podcasting app wherever you listen so um it was an it was trying to be more efficient that led to doing these things and so um when i first started what was really interesting was that i was more elaborate if you watch the early shows which i hope you have done you'll see that i had somebody reading the questions out for me initially in person and then I had somebody recording them as a voiceover. I also uh, maybe put a little bit of music in there um, and it did take time to edit those and I was finding that they took too long whether it was me that was doing it or somebody else that was doing it they just took too long to produce so you'll notice now it's very very streamlined streamlined if I can speak streamlined production in the sense that I just sit down turn the camera on and I talk and if I fall over my words saying things like streamlined, I leave it in because editing it out takes too long. Um, getting multiple different angles of the place that I am takes too long. Somebody suggested to me a couple of years ago, oh, it would be wonderful if you filmed yourself walking into the area, film the area a little bit more um, where you were so that we could see where you are. And it, no, because it takes too long. I wouldn't be able to do as many of these shows if I was doing that. So basically, I take my camera out with me and when I get the opportunity to, I sit down, I put it on a tripod and I talk to it and I answer the questions, which I basically have in a file sharing system on my phone. So what I'll do to be efficient is that once in a while, I will sit down and I will pull all the questions in off Twitter, all the questions in off Instagram, all the questions in off SpeakPipe, all the questions in off email, and I will quickly go through them, um, see what they're about, give those questions a heading, and then I will basically put them into a little reservoir of questions, and then I will say, right, I need six or seven for, for the next one, and I'll just go, right, bang, 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 just randomly select, move them over into the next episode, and then that's what I've got on my phone, and then I quickly go through. So I do very little preparation, and I just talk off the top of my head. And sometimes it can be a little bit rambly. Sometimes you get the benefit of seeing the cogs work as it were. Um, but the important thing is that I get them out 
and people get the benefit from them, even if I could spend more time polishing them. So it's a relatively straightforward thing for me to produce and it was aimed specifically at solving a problem which I had, which was I couldn't answer the questions that I was getting. And even when I could, only one person was getting the benefit of me answering the question. So that wasn't a great use of my time. This is a better use of my time. And that's how I have to judge these things. What's a good use of my time? What benefits the community out there that wants to know the things that I know? And so that's one of my motivations for doing it. I want to get that information out there. I want to get that experience out there. You may not agree with everything that I say. You may not like my delivery style, etc., etc. but that's fine. Um, there are other people that maybe suit you better, but the important point is that people that my stuff does resonate with, they get the benefit. The maximum number of people get the benefit and that's why I do it. I try and make my workflows as efficient as possible. Um, I'm fortunate, I think, as well, in that um, I've always been reasonably good with technology. Um, I've always had a passion for photography, so taking photographs of trees and plants and nature and adventures that I've been up to is, is something that I've always done. Um, I, the first badge I ever did in Scouts was my photography badge, and I took some photographs from the Great Orm in North Wales and Llandidno, and I took some photographs of an air show and put them in an album, and that was part of what I did for my photography badge in, sorry, not in Scouts, actually, in Cubs. Um, so photography's always been a passion of mine. It's something that continues, and video is a little bit of an extension of that, but I have to say I find videoing a lot of what I do too time consuming. So unfortunately for you guys, there's a lot of stuff that I get up to that you don't see. Um, there are trips that I've done uh, and there are trips that I've done this year that I've, we've got video footage of, but just have not had the time to sit down and edit them. Um, and maybe I will over the winter when I spend a, a bit more time indoors, darker nights, a bit more time indoors. But even so, there'll be only a certain amount that I get done. Um, I mentioned in the last Ask Paul Kirtley that I've got some um, plans for my YouTube channel. I would like to get a bit more out on YouTube, a bit more practical stuff on YouTube, a bit more of what we're doing in, in terms of trips and how we, how we manage those and what we do on trips um, because I think that's of benefit to people. Um, and again, it's about being of benefit uh, but maximising the use of my time. Um, I do enjoy writing. Um, when we go back to the writing, it helps Anybody who's done any writing will probably tell you that it helps crystallise your thinking on things. If you have to write an essay on something, it crystallises your thinking. So I used to hate writing essays at school. Um, I didn't really enjoy English particularly much. Um, I had some good English teachers not some, and some not so good English teachers. I was good at sciences, I was good at maths, I was good at art. Um, and I ended up, Jays, I ended up doing um, A-levels in maths, further maths, physics, economics and general studies. And the only A-level I had to do essays for were, was economics. And then I went and did a maths degree and didn't have to write any essays, apart from in some of my subsidiary subjects, which I enjoyed, um, philosophy of science and, and a few other bits and pieces. So I didn't really like writing, but the thing I do like doing is writing about subjects that I'm passionate about because it helps crystallise my thinking, getting it down on paper, honing it down and then sharing that out with other people. And then when I'm talking about things, that, that thinking has been crystallised, I've thought through things and I've come to certain conclusions or I've looked at things from different perspectives and when I'm talking, whether I'm doing a presentation, whether I'm teaching a course, you get the benefit of that as well. So uh, to me, writing is part of my process of reflecting on what I do and so it, I would be doing that anyway, I would be writing notes, I'd be reflecting, I'd be journaling about what I do and if I can turn some of that into articles that's great. Um, so I, I find that as sort of an essential part of what I do these days anyway. Photography is something that I've always done. Um, the podcasts have been interesting. Um, the, the podcast, the Paul Kirtley podcasts, if you don't listen to the Paul Kirtley podcast, then you're missing out. There are some fantastic guests I've had on the Paul Kirtley podcast. 
So again, bringing together wide range of experience and knowledge and sharing it with you. And they are conversations. Every single conversation that I've had on the Paul Kirtley podcast is a conversation I would have loved to have had anyway, even if the microphone wasn't turned on. So again, I am getting the benefit of that. I'm getting the benefit, I'm learning, I'm asking questions of the person that's a guest, um, and you're getting the benefit of eavesdropping, if you like, on that conversation. So that is, again, a way of me leveraging um, what really interests me anyway, but other people getting the benefit. So that's the way I tend to look at it, is how can I leverage the things that I love doing anyway how can I leverage the things that are beneficial to me, that I really enjoy photography, writing about my passions, and sharing some of that with other people. Um, the video side of things I'm still getting to grips with. I, I do quite enjoy the creativity of editing, um, particularly with a, with a whiskey in hand or, or a, a nice glass of red wine on a cold winter's evening. Um, just having the time to work through and put and craft something, I quite enjoy that. But equally, I have to say, I find it massively time consuming in terms of the amount of content that I can put out. And so um, that's something which I still grapple with in, in finding the right balance, I have to say, with making videos, apart from these, which are very easy to do. Um, and that brings me on to one other thing. You mentioned the Bushcraft Show presentation, and there was a similar question about the amount of content that I put out at the Bushcraft Show. And one of the things I mentioned there, I remember mentioning, is that I work hard. Yep. I don't work 40 hours a week. Yeah, I tend to work in terms of I'm out teaching or I'm filming or I'm doing interviews or I'm working on my business. Um, I work about 90 hours a week and I watch very little television. So while people might be going to work, you know, commuting a bit, working nine to five or nine to six, coming home, having the dinner, watching some Game of Thrones or uh, whatever your favorite TV show is or sport. I don't do that. I watch zero sports on television. I watch the occasional series um, such as, I don't know, Breaking Bad, for example. Um, but generally, I can go a month without watching television, even when I'm at home. Um, this is nothing that I would rather be doing than writing, sorting out photographs, labeling them, um, working through things for articles, editing videos. Somebody recently asked me, um, we were running a, a river spay trip, and somebody asked me, what do you do for leisure? And I actually struggled to answer that question because I don't really. Um, I do occasionally like going out for a meal. Um, I do like watching good movies. I like reading a good novel. Um, I like reading science fiction. Um, I like reading factual books about nature. But generally, a lot of what I do, whether it's first thing in the morning, last thing at night, throughout the day, whether I'm at home, whether I'm out, is to do with what I do for a living and what I do um, because it's my passion. And so that's very integrated. So I'm really, really grateful. And uh, I, I think I'm in a great position. I'm, I'm very, uh, I don't take it for granted that I'm able to balance um, my passion and my work in that way. Um, not that it's really a balance, if you see what I mean. So, but I can, I can sustain that. And so I'm, I'm very happy with being able to share stuff and to spend a huge amount of time outside. I like to try and get on a, a few courses myself every year, um, as well as doing things like the podcast interviews. I like to try and get, um, you know, try and get information in. I read quite a lot and I read while I'm on trips, I write notes while I'm on trips, um, try and just filter and organize my thoughts and my thinking and also try and get information in. And I also like to do some courses, um, professional qualifications, training courses um, that take my knowledge and skill level up in different ways as well. Um, and so a lot of my time is spent on this stuff. And so to, to answer your question, um, there are 40 hours in a normal working week. Um, there are 160 odd hours in a week. There, you could do two full-time jobs and still be only using half of your time. And so think about that in terms of people like me who spend a huge amount of time on their passion. Um, we are not doing 40 hour weeks. We are doing 
80 hour weeks at least and we are not doing the sorts of things that a lot of people are i don't have any kids i don't have to commute other than i've just worked in scotland for three weeks i have to get there but once i'm there i'm there when i'm working um, from my office at home in my study my commute is very short um, I don't spend a lot of time commuting and when I do it's in one batch and then I'm in a plate I go down to Sussex I'm working down there for several weeks I've got one commute at the beginning and one commute at the end of it and so I'm I've organized my life so I'm quite efficient with the use of my time as well and then I use it to the maximum to get everything I can in terms of knowledge and also sharing as much knowledge out to other people as well. And, and that's what I love doing. It doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work. So that's how I managed to produce so much and still do a lot of stuff outdoors. Um, I've got a lot planned for the winter and into the spring before we start with our full course season again. Um, I've just, I spent 28 days, 27 days, sorry, of September in Canada. I spent three weeks of October in Scotland. Um, I'm spending the last few days of October up here in the northeast of, of England. Three weeks of August I was outdoors, so on and so forth. So yeah, I do spend an awful lot of time outdoors and if there's any doubt about that, um, I, you know, I am not a phony in that sense. I do have some concerns though that there are people who have big followings on Instagram and YouTube who do not do what they do full time. There are people on YouTube who are managing um, stores, who are working in an office, um, who do their YouTube channel on the weekends, in the evenings. Um, they go and do a few trips every year. Um, they do a couple of trips and take a lot of photos and share them out over the course of the year. Um, there are some people who are making themselves out to be more than they are and um, they are giving the impression that they are outdoors all the time but they manage a liquor store they manage a DIY store there are some people who say they're full-time bushcraft instructors but they manage um, a DIY store I know these people I know this for a fact I'm not going to name names um, I think the world out there the audience is not stupid you can pick out the phonies from the people who are genuinely involved in outdoor education full time. That's what I am. I'm involved in outdoor education full time. My role, if you like, and it's self-appointed, but my role, what I try to do is educate people about outdoor skills and about nature and about how those two things fit together. That's what I do. And um, I'm very, very glad to be in the position that I'm in. And I'm very, very glad that people watch my um, material online, listen to my material online and the fact that people do leave comments on my blog means that I'm, I'm resonating with people, that people are taking the time to answer. I want to respect that and answer them as well. So I do prioritise answering things on my blog over answering things on social media for example because that's the core community. People who come to my blog who ask questions, who make comments, um, and I don't always get the chance to answer all of them or to comment on them. I read every single one, and a lot of them make me think about things, um, a lot of them make me uh, question things in different ways, and that's a great benefit for me as well, and other people reading those comments. Some of the articles I've written have scores, if not hundreds of comments on them, and there's a wealth of knowledge and experience and different perspectives in those comment sections as well, which wouldn't be there if I hadn't put that thing um, that initial uh, piece there in the first place. So I'm very, very glad and thankful to be in the middle of that um, and, and enabling that for other people as well. So that's why I do what I do. Um, it isn't always easy. I don't always get as much material out as I would like to, um, but it, it, it's a passion of mine and I, and I love doing it. In terms of other people, um, things getting in the way of yeah if people are constantly trying to instagram and you know one of the reasons i don't do a lot of live stuff um and sort of i, I tried snapchat for about 10 minutes um instagram stories i do a little bit sometimes but they kind of get in the way 
I like photography. I'll take photos. I'll take photos with my phone. I'll take photos. I often carry, I've always got a camera with me, often got a DSLR with me, um, and it's worth me carrying it. I, I enjoy taking photographs and I enjoy sharing beautiful images and interesting images of nature and adventure with other people. Um, and if and if people enjoy those, then that boosts my my enjoyment as well. I get something back from that. So not to say that I don't enjoy people enjoying my material. I do. Um, I don't want to sound too selfless. You know, there's a there's a little kind of positive feedback loop there for me as well. Um, so that that's why I, I do what I do. Um, that's why I think the the electronic side is valuable. Um, I can reach a much bigger audience and I can reach a bigger audience without having any intermediaries. I don't have to deal with a publisher. I don't have to deal with a production company. I don't have to deal with um, a radio production company or a TV production company. I don't have to deal with an, a, a, a book publisher and an editor and all of those things. I can put what I want out direct to you and that's why I think if you use the, the internet in that way, in a positive way, it's massively beneficial. But yeah, I agree, you don't want it in between you and nature all the time when you're out. And you wanna put your phone away and go around um, and see what you can see, hear what you can hear, um, listen to the birds alarm calling, see the rabbits, the foxes, the, listen to the buzzards, all of which has been going on today while I've been out and about, listen to the pheasant, um, going up to roost, all of those things that you, if you've got your head in your phone while you're out and about, you won't, you won't notice. So read up on things while you're at home, listen to podcasts while you're on your commute or in the gym or walking your dog, um, but then go out and use your eyes and your ears uh, and benefit from that as well and use the two together in a beneficial way. Um, that, that's what I think. And yeah, if you've got your phone out all the time, and you're trying to Snapchat everything and Instagram everything and video you and your friends, or if you're doing stuff just for the sake of getting a good Instagram photo, then you're kind of perverting um, the benefits of being outdoors. Um, just go out and enjoy, go out and have adventures, go out and camp, go out and build shelters, go out and have a fire and make your water safe and get the experience of being out there and interacting with the natural world spending nights out under the trees and under the stars, um, put the phones away. Yes, take a few photos, there's nothing wrong with that. I love photography, um, but just soak up the atmosphere when you're out. And that, that's a minimal technology, I would say, in, in that sense. And then when you're at home, you can give sucker to your interest, your passion. When you're at home, when you're on your way to work, when you're in the gym, as I say, you can get the benefit of all that information that's out there, reading, watching, listening. And I think that just the last thing on that point, just in case anybody's not convinced, um, when I was a kid, there was virtually nothing on television that was relevant to my interest in, in what was then, you know, survival skills and outdoor adventure. There wasn't a huge amount on television at all. Um, Lofty Wiseman cropped up occasionally and latterly Mears um, appeared but most of what we had access to were books and some of the books were not readily available and the occasional magazine um, that cropped up and um, that had some useful stuff in it like combat and survival um, the original multi-part series there's a lot of stuff in there about tanks and planes and machine guns and things but there was survival stuff in there there's some unarmed combat stuff in there which i found quite interesting um having gone on to do a couple of martial arts up to black belt level i found that stuff interesting even as a kid and i, su I suspect that's where the interest came from um but it was hard to get the info and it was hard to cross-reference the info now there is tons of information. There's good quality information out there and there's some bad quality information out there, but at least you can cross-reference it. You can join communities. You can connect with people that are like-minded and have similar interests all over the world. That's something I could not do when I was younger. Yep, 30 years ago, when I was first getting interested in these things, I could not do that. Um, I used to come to this area here and we used to, we used to build shelters and we used to um, play hide and seek and all sorts of stuff in this area, um, exactly this area. My parents have been in the same village for, for a long time. Um, but um, yeah, we, 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 we had limited information 
And I think once you start getting more information and if, you, if your filters are good, then you can get up that learning curve, sorry to annoy the people who don't like that cliche, um, find me some alternative terminology that, uh, that gets that point across without me using that term, happy. Uh, don't give me problems, give me solutions. Um, get you up that learning curve quicker um, than you ever could before. And then you can go out and apply it and then you get the direct experience, that feedback loop, and then you can come back and learn more. And you can layer on more and more and more. You've got more and more ability to expose yourself to different skill sets now than ever before. And I think that's only a good thing, but you do need a filter because there's so much noise out there and that's, that's important. Thank you for the question. Good opportunity to discuss that. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below this um, at paulkirtley.co.uk under episode 60 of Ask Paul Kirtley. And it is actually getting dark now. Um, I appreciate I talked about that a lot, but I think it's important. I think it's increasingly important. Um, technology is not going to go away. Um, and it's important. Right, next question. Bushcraft rust prevention in wet climates and a duvet jacket question. And this is from Gunter. And Gunter's question is, um, I always enjoy your Ask Paul Kirtley videos and uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good. To, he's just commenting on somebody giving me a hard time. Um, his question is, I'd like to ask you how you prevent your O1 bushcraft knife from rusting in wet climates. I find this quite challenging here in Germany and I assume it is the same in the UK. Do you use a special oil? Um, and then he's got a second question. Having asked this, I would like to ask you another question. What duvet jacket have you used? Was it a sleeker jacket? Many thanks. Best regards from Hanover, Gunter. Right, um, O1, um, yeah, if you leave, I mean, a lot of people know this, but if you leave O1 um, or other high carbon steel knives damp, um, they will rust quite quickly. And what I do um, at home, I'll sharpen the knife up and, and get it up to good, good scratch. Um, and I'll use a little bit of camellia oil typically, or um, I use uh, ballistol. Um, out in the field, um, I will always make sure it's dry before it goes back in the sheath. That's really important, whether you're using a plastic sheath or a leather sheath, if you're using an O1 tool steel knife, make sure it's dry before it goes back in the sheath. The problem with O1 knives comes when you get the sheath wet, if it's a leather sheath, plastic sheath is relatively easy to dry out, leather sheaths are hard to dry out. Um, which is why I don't use, why I no longer use O1 knives on canoe trips because I, I, in, on real wilderness trips, and I've said this before, which is why I'm going over it quickly, I like to have my knife on my belt. So for example, the trips that we did in Canada in September, I like to have a knife and a saw on my belt so that I am not separated from those things at any point in time. Um, but if you fall in, which happens sometimes, or maybe you just have to wade, and maybe you're lining your boat, maybe you have to wade, and you're coming up to the point where you're getting the sheath wet, um, that's gonna stay wet for a number of days. The knife is gonna get rusty. There's nothing you can do about that. So I use a stainless steel knife on canoe trips. Now there's a gray squirrel running around in the, uh, in the spruce above me here. Um, yeah, stainless steel. So. I typically use my personal knife, my best knife is an RWL 34 version of the knife that I designed, um, which I love for wilderness use, but I've also been using the uh, Mora Garberg recently, which has been good as well, which is a stainless steel uh, knife in it. And, and the, the version I've got has got a leather sheath as well. So um, stainless steel for canoe trips, but otherwise I do use an O1 um, knife and um, it's just a case of making sure it goes back into the sheath dry and the sheath doesn't get wet. And the, the chances of the sheath getting soaking wet in um, anything other than a canoe type environment are fairly limited. I, I don't do many river crossings. Um, if you were doing river crossings and you fell in and you slipped in, even if you just slipped over and got up again, yes, there's a chance, but I'm not doing a huge amount of that in, um, in my day-to-day -day life. And so, the chances of getting it wet are limited. Just make sure it's dry when it goes in. Um, if you want to use a bit of oil in the, in the field, a little bit of ballistol or camellia oil in a tiny little dropper works fine 
um, as well. Or if you're just in camp and you've got a bit of food oil around or even just a bit of grease, you know, if you're cutting some salami, um, okay, it might not be good in terms of bacteria, but if, if, if you've sharpened it in particular, I like to put something on it because you've just made the steel very open to the atmosphere. And I like to put a little bit of oil on, a little bit of grease on it, just to help keep condensation off it, if nothing else because that in itself can corrode. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's my answer to that. I don't find it particularly difficult to keep them corrosion free as long as they go back into the sheath dry. And once I've sharpened it, it's put there's some oil put on of some description um, or fat. Um, duvet jacket, I think you're probably asking about the green one that I sometimes wear. That is made, who was that made by? Nanok. Um, I don't know if they still make them anymore, um, I suspect they don't. Um, there are similar ones, Snug Pack makes similar ones. And the other duvet jacket that I use quite a lot is a mountain equipment one, which goes very nicely under some of my other jackets like the Nerona Recon. I made a video about that some time ago, that combination. Um, Fitzroy jacket, mountain equipment Fitzroy jacket um, is, is the one um, that I've used. And then winter trips, um, far north, Sweden, dry, cold, I use the old Swedish M90 over jacket as a mothership. Uh, ski tours, I tend to use a down jacket. I have a hydrophobic down Pertex Endurance Outer Rab Jacket. Can't remember the name of the model name, but that's very good as well. So those are all the different duvet jackets that I currently have in service for different types of trips. All outdoors, by the way. <laughs> Water filtration combined with other methods such as boiling or chemicals. This question is from Instagram. It is from Adrian Bell. Um, Adrian says, I'm upgrading to an MSR gravity filter. I was told water treatment is a choice of coarse filter and boil or fine filter and chemical. Can you fine filter and boil? I don't see why not. And I understand that coarse and chemical is a bad idea. Thank you for such an amazing series of podcasts and blogs. They're, they're always full of good info. Don't know where you find the time. Well, <laughs> please see the answer, the long answer to the first question um, for that last bit. Um, regards, a very happy Adrian after four nights disappearing in Wales. And he's got a photo of a Millbank bag feeding into a uh, Nalgene bottle there next to a little mess burner and a metal mug over the top of it. Um, so, the important thing with water filtration is to start at the beginning or water purification, water sterilization, and not just filtration. Yeah, start at the beginning and understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. And you do that by understanding what the potential problems are. Why are you even bothering to do anything to the water? Why are you not just drinking it? There's a stream over there. Why am I not just drinking the water straight out of the stream? Why do I need to do anything to it? Well, it's because there are some problems and you need to understand what those problems are. Again, I've written articles about this. You can go to my blog, uh, five water contaminants you need to know about. But basically, there are three categories of um, pathogenic organisms you need to worry about. Protozoa, bacteria and viruses. You need to worry about floaty bits. You need to worry about floaty bits or turbidity that are organic matter, um, decaying leaf litter, sand, soil, mineral material, anything that's floating around that is going to make the water murky. That's another category. And then you also need to worry about chemical pollutants, heavy metals, that type of thing. Pesticides included in that. Um, agricultural runoff in terms of nitrates and all those sorts of things. Um, that's it. Those are the things you need to worry about. And what you do to the water is aimed at removing those things from the water. Now, in some places, all of those things are not present. In many places, all of those things are not present. It's a subsection of those things, subset, subset of those five which are present. And you are going to select a methodology which deals with what the local conditions are. If you don't know what the local conditions are, um, you should assume that there are pathogenic organisms in there. If you look at the water, 
and it's cloudy, it's turbid, that's easy. And um, you kind of need to have a bit of local knowledge um, to find out whether or not there's, there's any sort of chemical pollution. Is there a chemical plant nearby? Read the guidebook. Is there some sort of water table pollution from old mining operations? Those sorts of things. You can find those things out, um, whether or not you need to deal with that. So in terms of pathogenic organisms, protozoa, things like Giardia, Cryptosporidium, are quite large. They're easy to filter out with fine filters. Um, some of the larger bacteria you can filter out with fine filters. Viruses don't tend to be swimming around because they don't do that on their own. They tend to be in, inside bacteria and attached to things like feces. Um, and if you're, if you're removing the turbidity, you're going to remove a lot of the organic matter that things can be attached to. Um, so chemicals will deal with certain thing, pathogenic organisms. Um, chlorine will not kill protozoa. Chlorine um, will not work very well if there's lots of organic matter in the water. Iodine works better, but it won't necessarily kill Cryptosporidium and it won't necessarily kill some strains of Giardia. And then chlorine dioxide, which, either, which is your other option really, will kill everything, um, but it's quite expensive for the amount of water you can produce. So you've got a number of different options. Coarse filtration, Millbank bags, um, brown bags now, go to uh, the episode 23 of the Paul Kirtley podcast where I have an interview and discussion with Rupert Brown who uh, uh, put into production the brown bag as a replacement, uh, a supersedent if you like, of the Millbank bag. That's very interesting there and we talk about these things in more detail so please check that out. Um, I'll try and remember to put a link to that in the show notes here um, as well as if you're listening on, if you're watching on YouTube, wherever the thing appears here, the cards, I will put it up there as well. Um, if I remember. Um, giving myself more to do in the editing process. Every time I say one of those things, I give myself more to do. Um, going back to the first question, so I try and limit it. Um, but that's an important one. Go and listen to that interview with Rupert. So, um, the point being is that there are a number of different methods that deal with different aspects of your water purification. Boiling will kill all of the pathogenic organisms, but it won't remove turbidity. So what you end up with, in short, um, is that you need a combination of different methods to deal with a combination of different problems. So um, w without recapping on all the problems, the protocols that work really well as combinations that are bomb proof regardless of what combination of pathogenic organisms and turbidity you have is coarse filtration. And often that is a Millbank bag or brown bag, but equally it could be a piece of parachute silk over the intake of your water pump uh, system, water filtration pump. Um, something that stops the bits getting in. Then you've got microfiltration, which is really, really fine ceramic filters, typically something like a catadin pocket filter, MSR gravity filter that you've talked about, and some of the other filtration systems that are out there have really fine ceramic fil filters in them. And that's gonna get rid of the larger pathogenic organisms. And then you're left with something that's visibly clear and devoid of most of the pathogenic organisms. Um, but if you want an absolute bomb proof um, solution, you then wanna put some chemical treatment in there that's going to kill off anything that might be left. There might be some bacteria left in there, for example. Chlorine will kill bacteria as long as the water is relatively clean, um, but you've filtered out the particulate matter, you put it through a microfilter as well, and then put in chlorine. So coarse filtration, microfiltration, and chlorine works super well. That works well on a personal level. It also works well in the camp, even in places like Africa. Stirrup pump, catadin filter, into a jerry can, chlorine in there, that's great, that works fine. Um, boiling will kill all of the pathogens, so if it's murky, just use a coarse pre-filter like a Millbank bag or a brown bag, then boil it, rolling boil, um, below 2,000 meters or 6,000 feet, rolling boil will kill everything. Above 2,000 meters or 6,000 feet, rolling boil for three to four minutes will kill everything. That's your solution. Um, and those two are fine. Microfiltration and then boiling, as you've mentioned, will also work if you're concerned about there being some bacteria left in there and you don't have any chlorine, but it's probably overkill in a lot of places. So for example, when I go to Canada, um, the main concern is uh, where I'm going in, in pretty wild places is 
mainly Giardia and possibly E. coli, um, mainly Giardia though, and just putting it through a microfilter is going to deal with that. You don't need to boil it afterwards, or if it's visibly clear, just boil it over the campfire and then it's fine as well. Um, but there's nothing wrong with microfiltering and then boiling, but it's often overkill to answer your question. Check out that five contaminants article if you've not seen it on my blog paulkirtley.co.uk right that's that question oh we've lost where we're going uh time to set up camp uh this is from mick via instagram um, he says recently i took my 12 year old grandson plus a friend and his father for a few days wild camping in scotland we tried to take minimal kit and set up camp on arrival my question is how much time do you allow from arriving at a new and unknown site to find a suitable area all the wood, craft the necessary stuff like pot hangers, etc. It took us three and a half hours from landing in our canoes to getting our dinner on. We did have a bit of kit to shift and wood was a bit of was a bit tricky, I think that's supposed to say, but would love to know your views. We wanted to be settled before nightfall and did allow enough time, but it took a bit longer than I thought. There was a dangerous dead tree near our site which we made safe, uh, which took a bit of time. Okay, so there's kind of a few sub questions there. I am actually looking at the screen. It's gone dark. I'm going to switch the, this is the camera that's got the, uh, got the infrared torch on it. And you can see me again if you're watching on video. 10 past six and it's too dark to film. All right, uh, nice relatively new moon coming up there as well, crescent moon. Sunset over there, crescent moon there, not long behind the sunset as you'd imagine. Um, so um, how long does it take? Um, it depends. Um, what does it depend upon? It depends upon um, how experienced the people are, for starters. Um, I know if I do a trip with somebody like Spoons or Henry or Ian that I work with and we're a small number, we'll get stuff set up pretty quickly um, because we, we're doing it all the time. We are setting up tarps regularly. You know, I've, I've talked earlier about how much time we spend outside. Um, and those guys don't spend as much time outside as I do because they do do other things as well as work with me. Um, I run pretty much every single program at Frontier Bushcraft. Um, and so I'm out the most, but um, they are very uh, proficient in all of those skills, setting up tarps, lighting fires, finding water, doing things in the right order. And this is something I often have to tell students. we'll say to them, go and set up a tarp, go and set up your camp, get a fire going, get some water boiled. And what the students do is they go and they do it literally in that order. Um, you know, go and set up your personal camps, get, a, get hot water, have a, have a brew, come back for a briefing. That might be something that we would tell students if we got to a camp and they had the basic skills. But what they often do is they will go up and they will find somewhere to put their tarps, they will string their tarp up, then they will go and find something to make the pegs for the tarps if they don't have some already. And they'll do that and then they'll get their bivvy bag out or put their hammock up and then they'll set everything up. And then they'll start getting some firewood in and then they'll go and get some water. Uh, or even what they'll do is they'll get the firewood in, they'll light the fire, leave the fire blazing, go and get some water, come back, then put the 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 pot next to the fire or over the fire that's the wrong order in which to do things if you want to do things quickly the order to do things if you want to do things quickly and this is just an example in that situation is everyone in that group might be working together in a three or a four or even if it's just two of you or even if it's just one of you um, go and get the firewood find where you're going to have your fire Get, you, get all that sorted, get your water, 
have your pot hanger, have everything ready, light your fire. The first flames, as soon as that fire is burning um, strongly and it's established quickly, within a minute of lighting that fire, it should be if you've got your preparations right, water goes on over the fire. Right? It's, it's, it's heating. Then put some more, bit more firewood in so it's going to keep going. Then go and start putting your tarp up somewhere nearby. And you should have already thought about where your tarp's going to be, but not spent any great time on it. Um, then do your tarp stuff. If you need to just knit back and put some more firewood in, do it. But by the time you've got your tarp and stuff sorted, your basic sleeping kit, and it does help hurry you on as well because your water your water's going to be boiled and then you can have your brew and then you're ready. And it's much quicker doing it that way. Doing things in the right order makes a huge difference. The other thing that makes a huge difference is just proficiency. Yeah, How often do you do these things? How many times in the past have you done them? Yeah, If you're doing stuff all the time, yeah, you're quick, you know, you know the right materials to find, you're making a pot hanger, you can make the right relevant cuts quickly, your knife proficiency is quick for making um, pot hangers or tent pegs, all of those things. Your proficiency with tarp knots is um, such that you can tie them very quickly, that you can pull all the guy lines to the right angles. One of the things that people have commented on, on say for example, the River Spay trip that we do, we had some guys with us last year who are really into their bushcraft. They have YouTube channels. And one of the things they said to us was they could not believe how quick we got stuff set up. And that when I say we, that there was me, Ray Goodwin, and we had spoons with us as well. And they'd have set their personal stuff up and they come back, we've got our personal stuff set up, we've got a group camp set up, we've got a tripod made, we've got kettles boiled, um, we've got firewood in, and it's because we're, we, we do things in the right order, but there's also a proficiency there. Um, Ray Goodwin is you know, exactly on the same page as me on this. He gets into camp and he gets his tent up, he gets his tarp up, he gets changed, he gets sorted um, quickly because he's got a system and having systems um, are important. Now, when you're working together as a group on a trip, and I know this again from experience, particularly when we're guiding people, it takes a few days for everyone to get into the system. Where, where is everything? You know, where's everything packed? Where's the brew kit? How are the pots and pans packed? How do we set up this grill and this pot and this pot hanger and all these things? But after a few days, people get into the routine of doing things in a particular order. Um, they get to know the tarp knots, they get to know um, just how everything works and it's, it's more slick. So you're right, leave plenty of time at the beginning so that you can get those routines going. Now, if you're only out for a day or two, those routine, routines don't really develop to the extent that they're very efficient. Um, I know from doing you know, three to four day trips, they start to become more efficient. So the spay trip that you did recently, Mick, You'll, you'll see that people started to get into the routine. People on the trip that we were leading got into the routine better towards the end than at the beginning. Um, on longer trips, it tends to get even more slick or with people who are just, they just know the score, it tends to be quite slick from the beginning. Um, and so it, it, can, it can, clearly it can vary depending on the resources that are available, how tired you are and whatnot, but you tend to have this attitude of, right, okay, let's just screw the nut, get these things sorted, and then we can relax. And that's always my attitude. I know it's the attitude of people like Spoons, it's the attitude of people like Henry, it's the attitude of people like Ray Goodwin. We just get stuff sorted as quickly as possible, even if we're tired, even if we're hungry, and then we can relax, doing things in the right order, and just the more you do it, the quicker you'll get at it um, personally. And then as a group, you're gonna have to take a few days to, to, to lead into things. So yeah, it could take you three hours. Um, and then if you're including dinner in that, is it a simple meal or is it a complex meal? Does it require people to sit down and chop vegetables or is it literally just boil some water and, and chuck it in, leave it to stand for five minutes? It, it depends in that respect. But in terms of setting up a basic personal camp, setting up a group camp, getting a fire going, getting water boiled, getting a brew on, it shouldn't take you more than 30 minutes, really, for those basic things. Um, 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how easy the firewood is to get hold of. Um, and then, from there in terms of getting some more firewood in so you've got enough for the rest of the night, got enough for the next morning and um, making sure that uh, 
your dinner's prepped properly, clearly that depends on the on the recipe. Lots of jackdaws coming. I don't know if you can hear those on the on the uh, microphone, but that's what that noise is in the background. There's a whole flock of jackdaws over the, the back there. Slug invasion. This is from Jonathan. This is from a little while ago. And again, going back to the first question, it does take me a while to get around to answering these questions sometimes um, because I am not doing it as much as I could be. I've got to, you know, I only ever put one ask Paul Kirtley out a week at most. On average, I think it's averaged one every two weeks. Um, and I only can answer so many questions. And uh, so, so yes, uh, apologies. This is from this is from the beginning of August. This one, um, and I know there are some from before that that I haven't answered. Um, so Jonathan asks: A few days ago, I did my first overnight wild camp in a wooded area on a hill. The conditions were wet and damp, and I used a tarp, plow point setup with a sleeping bag and bivy underneath. During the night, I was invaded by slugs, which were both on the outside and underside of my tarp, over my gear and in my hair. It was totally gross and some of my clothing I had to wash twice to get the slime off. Have I just been unlucky or is this a common problem? And if so, what can I do in the future to keep the slugs away? Kind regards, Jonathan. Well, slugs are not uncommon in the countryside. Um, I've spent years and years and years working outdoors, um, certainly spring through summer through to the beginning of the fall in the same sort of places. Um, I worked for a long time um, at certain places in Sussex and now with Frontier, we've been using the same area for six or seven years. And I have to say the slug population varies in the same place from year to year. I and mean, it's just, you get the same, you know, if you, it's one of the great things, and I encourage people on my tree and plant ID masterclass to do this as well, is have somewhere that you go to on a regular basis because you get to see the changes through the seasons. And if you can go back there from one year to the next as well, you get to see that there's, a, as, there's an annual variation as well. Um, fungi, how early leaves come out, when flowers come out, when certain leaves start to fall, when nuts form, how many nuts form, how many berries form, how much fungi there is, what different species of fungi there are. All of these things vary. How many birds there are around, how many butterflies, when the mozzies appear, when there are midges, all of these things show variation from one year to the next and slugs are no different and they do interact with other things. There are certain things that they feed on, there are certain things that different species of slugs feed on and then there are also things that feed on slugs and you know um, blackbirds and other thrush uh, birds, um, turdus, uh, they will feed on young slugs but if there aren't so many thrushes around then you get more slugs later on the, well you get more sl small slugs surviving and then you get more big slugs later in the season moisture dampness has an effect as well um, and so yes we have had some years where there are just an inordinate number of slugs around and they just are a real pest. And other years you see virtually none at the same time of year as you had a plague of them the previous year. So it does vary from year to year. It's not uncommon to see slugs. Um, it's not uncommon for slugs to be crawling on your gear if you're, if you're on the ground. It's, if you bring in your tarp down to the ground as well, like it sounds like you did, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that you've got slugs climbing up. Um, they just go out and explore. Um, and yes, if you're sleeping on the ground, you might occasionally get slugs crawling over you. So it, it, it's something to be expected um, in a general sense. But what can you do? Um, well, if in terms of keeping them off your tarp, you could keep your tarp just up a little bit away from the ground. That's one thing. But clearly there are other aspects to consider there as well, depending on the weather, how much of a pocket of warm air you want to try and create, what's the rain doing, all of those sorts of things. But that's a consideration. One of the things that I do when there are a lot of slugs around is I will <laughs> what I call do a slug patrol. Literally, I'll brush my teeth. The last thing I do before I get into bed and I'll walk around my tarp and any large slugs that I can see, I will literally just pick them up and throw them, you know, meters. And it's probably a bit cruel, but um, throw them away so that because they only cover a certain number of meters an hour. 
that if I've just thrown them five meters away, um, they're that much further away from me. So any, any obvious large slugs that are making their way towards my tarp just before I go to bed, and it doesn't take very long to do because you can spot them pretty easily, um, chuck them away and then I go to bed. And that does diminish things uh, to an extent. And, and that's about as much advice as I can give you. Um, if you're gonna go out into nature and you are not gonna seal yourself in a tent, you are going to have some interaction with the environment and with some of the creatures. It, it just stands to reason. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate when you have a right plague of slugs, but fortunately, in my experience, that doesn't happen so often, but you should expect to see them sometimes. And believe it or not, some of them do bite. Um, some of them do try and feed on you. Um, not to scare people away from the outdoors too much, but um, it's not it's not dangerous. It's just, it happens from time to time. They just sort of suck your forehead or your hand or something. And it, that brings me on to another point, which I'll go into in more detail at some other po uh, point in time. But I know you're new to the outdoors, Jonathan, and this is not, and it's certainly new to that style of camping by the sound of it. But one of the things you've got to remember is that sometimes when you spend time outdoors there will be some discomforts you will get wet you will get a bit cold you will get a bit hungry there might be a lump under your sleeping mat at night and um, you might get a drip on your face when you're hanging in your hammock you are not going to be as warm and stable as you might be if you're in a centrally heated bedroom but there are so many more benefits to being outdoors than there are detriments that you suck that stuff up and you harden to it over over time yes you get blisters yes you get sore yes you get chafing yes you get wet yes you get smelly you get bitten um, you have uncomfortable night's sleep things wake you up um, smoke gets in your eyes things you know things bother you but that's kind of part of what's being a human being in the outdoors rather than isolating yourself from nature that's part of it and while you, you you should clearly be careful about certain aspects of that so staying clear of sleeping on the ground in areas where there are dangerous insects or snakes or not interacting in, neg in dangerously negative ways some of some knocks and scrapes and minor burns and minor bites and those sorts of things they're part and parcel of being outdoors and you can't completely immunize and isolate yourself from those things you just can't you can't be in a cocoon that's the whole point and that's not aimed at you jonathan but it's just some comments that i see from time to time um about want people wanting to be more and more and more comfortable outside it's like stop it stop that it's the wrong way of thinking about it yes any fool can be uncomfortable but if your sole focus of going outside is to be comfortable then you're thinking about it the wrong way there are so many other benefits to being outdoors and if you overly focus on one thing you miss all the others verging on a rant there not quite <laughs> all right question last question this is about trail mix hi paul as always thanks for the fantastic content you're the gold standard for guidelines in my self-study well that's very kind thank you thank you gregor um i have a feeling my question might be a little bit silly but perhaps you can find a place for an ask paul curtly sometime well it's been a while you asked this question in june so apologies it's taken a while um his question is every spring I have a bit of fun with going to the bulk food store and crafting a big batch of trail mix, otherwise known as GORP. And anybody who doesn't know what GORP is, I'm amazed at the number of people who don't know what GORP is. G-O-R-P, good old raisins and peanuts, GORP. So he makes some GORP or trail mix for the upcoming summer's trips. It's become an interesting long-term project, picking and testing ingredients and refining my recipe. The question is, what's your favorite trail mix if you munch on trail mix at all? What factors do you consider when mixing it up or do you put that much thought into it in the first place? Keep up the great work, Greg. 
Um, I don't put as much thought into it as I used to, Greg, um, but I do like a good bit of gore. And in fact, one of the things I had in my pack today, and there's a little bit left, was some uh, mix that I made up for paddling the spay the other week. And I had some left and I brought it out in my backpack today just to munch on. And I had a bit just before I filmed this, um, just to boost my uh, uh, blood sugar levels so that I wasn't too slow um, in my responses, just to give me a bit of brain energy. Remember, your brain is an obligate glucose consumer and about 25% of your body's energy uh, consumption is usually dedicated to your brain. Um, your brain uses a lot of energy. So um, good tip if you're ever doing a talk or answering questions, um, have a little bit of coffee perhaps, and that mobilizes fatty acids. Um, caffeine's a stimulant, of course, and have some a mixture of some simple sugars and slightly more complex sugars. Uh, and gorp is great for that. So what do I like to put in gorp? Um, I like, as a very, very basic thing, I like to have some dried fruit. Um, very, very, you know, basic version of that is some, is some raisins or sultanas, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I like to put some nuts in there. I really like Brazil nuts. I like um, hazelnuts in particular. And then I like to put something uh, chocolatey in there. And in the past, if it's cold, I'll get some, I get a, a block of um, milk chocolate, Cadbury's milk chocolate here, but in other places, other, other types, break it up into, into the blocks and mix that up. Um, M&M's, chocolate M&M's go quite well in, to my taste in with the nuts and the fruit. And I also, if I can, I like to chuck some seeds in there, uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, that type of thing. Um, so there's a real mix of nutrients in there and there's some taste and there's some texture. Um, I tried uh, peanut M&M's. I don't like them as much because there's the nutty flavor already and it's kind of overdoes the nuttiness for me. So I like regular M&M's or Smarties. Smarties are quite good. Um, dried fruit, nuts, hazelnuts and so on and so forth. I don't tend to put so much, pe I, don't, I don't like peanuts so much. Um, they often have a, a slightly unpleasant aftertaste if they're not, um, dry roasted and salted and I think the dry roasted and salty versions are probably if you're eating lots of them if you're doing lots of hiking lots of outdoor stuff are probably not so healthy if it's really hot sweaty weather I might throw some uh, salted peanuts in there as well or even some dry roasted salted peanuts just for a bit of extra salt intake um, and that's quite nice. The sweet and the salty goes quite nice together. Um, but that's about as much as I, I, I think, think about it. And what I will often do these days, because they're easier to get hold of, is before a trip, I will literally buy uh, a bag of mixed fruit and nuts and seeds, which you can get in some uh, supermarkets, some stores here. And then I'll just put a couple of bags of those in a Ziploc, and then I'll put a bag of um, of chocolate M&Ms in and I'll just shake it up and then I'll decant them out into a bag for for that trip or that um, that couple of days or what have you and that's about as much as I do these days. Um, I had a bad experience with milk chocolate on a hot trip um, it was only in Scotland but it was a what it just it was one June it came out really hot and all of my chocolate blocks melted <laughs> into this bag of gulp and it was just a awful mess. Um, so I, I am a little bit careful about that, which is why I think the, the, the Smarties or the M&Ms are a better, better solution because they've got that coating. And then of course you could get crazy and throw things like um, uh, jelly tots or even you know har sour Haribo sweets and things in there. I know some people do that. That's kind of fun for a, for a, for a novelty, but I, I've already described what my favorite is. And, yeah, that's that's kind of as, as far as I go with it these days. I'd be interested to hear what your secret recipe is, though, if you uh, if you want to let us know, Greg. And that brings us to the end of this episode. It is properly um, dusky now. The sun's gone down. The moon is coming out. It's relatively clear. Uh, the breeze is still blowing through the trees. The, the jackdaws are still going crazy over on the field over there. Um, Jackdaws are a small corvid, if you don't know what a jackdaw is. Um, quite cheeky, quite intelligent, 
always in big flocks, certainly at this time of year, quite vocal um, and I quite enjoy them, uh, seeing them. So that brings us to the end of this. I'm going to wander back, um, back up uh, over the over the fields and through the woods to the to the village, um, towards the end of my my loop through here. I was hoping to get here a bit sooner. Sorry if you're watching on video that it's got dark, but hopefully it's the verbal content which is important and that you've enjoyed. Thanks for listening on the audio as well. Please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed already. Please do subscribe to the podcast on your favourite platform if you're not subscribed already and you like downloading them that way. And if you are not already listening to the Paul Kirtley podcast, which is a separate podcast series to the Ask Paul Kirtley series, I will link to that in the show notes. I will link to it on a thing, a card here on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're already on my blog, just go to podcast in the top uh, menu and then you will, as it's right next to Ask Paul Kirtley in the top menu in the menu bar and subscribe to that in the way that you want to. And that's an audio only podcast. There is no video. Um, they are long form discussions and interviews with a lot of good information and bringing lots of people's experience in wild and remote places, in ethnobotany, in anthropology, and many other disciplines. Um, lots of really high quality information from those high quality guests that I have. Um, everyone from Tristan Gooley to Lou Rudd, uh, Ray Goodwin's been on a course, uh, of course a few times as well, We're talking about expeditioning and canoeing. Um, Alyssa Crittenden, Lisa Fenton, Harry Sepp, loads and loads of good quality people and I'm going to continue getting more good quality people on over the coming months so please do subscribe to that. Um, I'm very excited about where that podcast is going. If you're not subscribing to the Paul Kirtley podcast, please, as soon as you finish listening to this, as soon as you finish watching it, go and do that. You are missing out if you are not listening to that podcast series. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. Keep them coming in and I will see you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Take care and get yourselves outdoors. <laughs>